We're going to do two 20-minute sessions and we're going to hold questions to the end. Okay. So it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce, first of all, Michelle Egar, followed by Catherine McSherry. Michelle is going to give us the Australian version of uh, what we heard this morning. We heard from Ivy this morning about the um, American experience of collaborative sharing. So Michelle is going to talk to us this afternoon about CAVL, um, Cooperative Action by Victorian Academic Libraries, which is an Australian library collaborative experience. So Michelle is currently working at Trinity, has previously worked at UCD, but spent seven years, eight years in Australia. So has lots of experience to share with us. Michelle. Okay, welcome back from lunch, everybody. I hope everyone enjoyed their meal. I didn't. <laughs> a bit anxious here, but not to worry. Anyway, um, as uh, Kate said, I'm w currently working in Trinity College, but I spent eight years working for Caval, um, an Australian library consortium based in uh, Melbourne. And this presentation is hopefully, if the clicker works, it's going to start. Oh, oh, back. Sorry about this. Okay, so um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a brief introduction to the background of Caval and what it is and how it's run and structured. A little bit about the collaborative services and partnerships that it does offer, uh, focusing in particular on two aspects of the service. So the CARM shared collection and the shared storage facilities are going to be the, the two topics I really concentrate on. So I will zip through really the, the preliminary, preliminary ones. I'll talk a little bit about the experiences of this collaborative model, um, things that might be considered positive and maybe other aspects which may be, have more negative aspects to them, and then maybe reflect a little bit on the possibilities for an all-Ireland um, maybe collaborative experience. So forgive me now, I will whip, whip through the first few slides. If it, sorry, this doesn't seem to be working. Oh, here we go. Okay, so there's just the map of La Trobe University. Um, Caval is based in the Research and Development Park in La Trobe University. It's in Bundura. Thanks. It's based in Bundura. It's about uh, 20 kilometres north of the Melbourne CBD. Um, Caval actually stands for Cooperative Action by Victorian Academic Libraries. It was established in 1978 and it is technically a not-for-profit organisation, although now they prefer to call it a not-for-loss organisation, um, which is a very important distinction. Um, its vision is really to anticipate, offer and develop services in partnership with university libraries to support the integration and access of information resources for teaching, learning and research and its value proposition, which is very important to its members, to provide access to cost-effective and collaborative library support services through economies of scale, scope and expertise in a trusted, secure and risk-managed environment. And we've heard, of course, this morning all about how important the issue of trust is in collaborative um, um, setups. Um, Caval has 11 members, member universities, they're all listed here. The newbies to the group would really be the University of Tasmania and the University of New South Wales, who obviously enough aren't from the state of Victoria, so the remit of Caval has, has expanded a little bit from just being a Victorian only focus. And each of those um, universities actually has a student body of approximately they average out at about 40,000 per institution, so it's a considerable amount of students we're talking about here. So Caval is run by a CEO and has a staff of about 40 um, members, plus or minus uh, part-timers, full-timers and so on. And it's governed by a board of directors who do all of that good stuff there, all the fun stuff, monitoring CEO performance. And the very last one, they have an obligation to act in the best interests of all Caval shareholders and to protect Caval's assets and reputation. Reputation is very, very important, as we all, all know. Now, just moving on quickly to a few of the services and partnerships that Caval offer and are involved in. Um, Caval run career and personal development programmes, um, high-end leadership residential workshops and uh, mentoring programme, which I myself participated in a couple of years back. They are also responsible for running these listed interest 
groups and committees. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, really the last one there, the CARM Shared Collection Advisory Committee, is one that's going to be relevant to what I'm going to really focus on today, which is the CARM Shared Collection. And those groups would meet quite frequently. Um, any interested member can attend those meetings. Um, Caval also has a Languages Direct business arm, which offers languages other than English for mainly public libraries, but any interested parties can partake of their purchasing, um, collaborative purchasing and cataloguing um, packages. The Lote Express is very popular with public libraries throughout Australia and is gaining ground constantly because of the fact that Caval do all the purchasing, uh, batch cataloguing and things like that, so they can save, um, there are savings to be made with that collaborative approach. Um, Caval also obviously offers cataloguing services. I was m member of that department. I catalogued material directly into the CARM shared collection, but uh, that was mainly English language material. Um, but they, they, they can catalogue uh, material in up to or more than 80 languages, and they will actually hire um, staff to catalogue in any language that they don't have the expertise in, so they're, they're prepared to do that. Um, there's also a st statistics service um, provided by Caval, and since 1992 they have actually compiled the call uh, statistics, which is the Council of Australian University Libraries. Um, Caval is also in partnership with the Canadian company, Relay International. I, maybe people are familiar with them, maybe not. They're, they are concerned with uh, resource discovery and interlibrary lending. Um, so Caval support and host the Relay International ILL and doc, doc, document delivery service for the Australasian customers for um, Relay International and provide all sorts of um, staff uh, support and organise meetings for um, um, Relay International users so they can get together and discuss uh, wish lists and things like that. And another, sorry it's just stuck a little bit, but there is another slide coming up with another Relay um, collaboration, Caval Borrow. Um, Caval Borrow is a Relay International product. Caval, it's a Relay D2D discovery to delivery um, product. And that's basically a user enabling um, library borrowing tool. So if a user was to click on that um, icon in their library catalogue, they would be taken to a number of libraries who may hold a copy of what they're looking for if their own library doesn't have it. And they can request themselves directly using that service. So they don't have to go and fill out any interlibrary loan documentation at a desk or whatnot. And um, there's also a reciprocal borrowing scheme, which Caval runs, 21 participating institutions. Um, 10 of which are non-member institutions. So there's quite a, cover quite a wide coverage there. Now, shared collection. This is um, my little pet, I suppose. I worked uh, for the CARM shared collection. I catalogued material into that. CARM stands for Caval Archival and Research Material. And it, it contains member libraries materials only. So you can see there on the little pie chart there are um, members listed down on the right hand side. The two largest um, members are the University of Melbourne in that sort of pale blue and then that purpley colour is Monash University and those would be two of the largest universities in Australia and they have um, formed the largest part of that shared collection through contributing their own materials to that collection. Um, each of these members were allocated a notional space in the repository, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to the storage aspect of it. Um, and currently that collection um, whole is, uh, consists of over one million volumes of material that are being held. Um, it's important to note actually that all the material that went in to, or goes into the shared collection, its ownership is ceded to Caval. So the member library, once they contribute something to um, the shared collection, they immediately, well, they have two, a two-week grace, uh, grace cooling off period, but they cede ownership of the material to Caval. Um, there's no collection development policy for that shared collection. It's very much dependent on um, the member library deciding what they want to contribute. But we do hope that, in theory, it should be the last copy of something. Um, it should be a low-use research material. And we don't accept duplicates into that collection either. 
Um, all of those um, items can be tracked down using the, our own online catalogue. And into that, we can either catalogue directly, which is what I used to do, so catalog the material as it came in and, um, and ingested into the collection, or we could do a bibliographic uh, batch load of a file that was sent from the member library into our um, database. It's all searchable via the Z3950 protocol, and all our holdings do go to um, Libraries Australia and OCLC WorldCat. Um, importantly, once something goes into the CARM shared collection, uh, members have full access to that material whenever they need it through the interlibrary loans and doc document delivery service, as do non-members, although they would have certain restrictions applying to them. So, for example, if they were but wanted to borrow a monograph, um, a non-member library could apply for that, but it would be the term and condition for use would be in library use only, just to, to protect the resource, really. There's a screenshot of Trove that's from the National Library of Australia. And I'm just going to show you a quick example, hopefully, of a little title I searched for in Trove. And it should come up. I'll show you the holdings. There are the holdings. You can see second from the top there, Caval Carm Centre. And it, and it lists also all the other um, libraries in Australia which actually hold that resource. And I'm delighted to see that only one of our member libraries has a copy of that in their library because the idea of the shared collection is that if a member has, a members contribute material to that collection, they shouldn't have to keep a copy of their own on their open shelf. We have one copy which we can loan to all our member libraries. So um, if you clicked on Caval Carm Centre there, it will take you straight into our catalogue and, I, and I also apologies, I keep saying R and me and we. It's just force of habit. I do work for Trinity. Um, okay, so there we, it takes you straight in to the, our shared collection catalog there. And oh, I'm so sorry, this isn't terribly responsive. And this is an, a screenshot of one of our member libraries, Monash University, who have actually ingested our holdings into their catalog. And they have actually got that title in there. And you can see there it says under the Get It tab, it's available in CARM Offsite Store. So that's another way you, um, our member libraries can sort of link into our content as well. Now, I'm going to crack on and talk to you now a little bit about the storage and management of collections. We have uh, two repositories in Caval, CARM1 and CARM2. CARM1 was modelled on the high density model, and CARM2 is a mixture of both. So, um, this one is CARM1. It was opened in 1996 on that site in La Trobe University. It was funded um, mostly by the members that we saw in that pie chart. Um, as well as a little bit of funding from the Australian government and from the state government of Victoria as well. They also contributed some funds. Um, CARM1 houses the CARM shared collection and you can see how the high density model is arrived at with this configuration. There's 15 kilometres of freestanding configurable steel shelving in CARM1 across three levels. Um, and you'll note that uh, the specially designed book trays there are designed to fit exactly the length of each shelf and exactly the depth going back of each shelf so that there's very little space wasted. Um, on top of that, um, you can see that there's obviously no call number ordering going on here, no shelf marks. It's all uh, shelved by size and that goes back to the notional space in, in the shared collection. Um, so space used by our members was tracked by um, the volume going in rather than um, the linear meterage as such. Um, and in order to locate anything in that store, you, we use three layers or levels of barcoding. So there's a book barcode goes on the book, there's a tray barcode on the tray, and there's a location code on the shelf. And all of that information is scanned into a text file and then loaded into the bibliographic or da data in the database, um, which appears in the bib record and it'll appear in the item record as well. So if we do get a request for something, we know the barcode, we know um, the book barcode, we know the location, we know the box. So we know exactly where to go in the store to get it. And I should have also said that any unused space in that store or even space that was sort of accidental space, like walkway space, we, could, we were able to use as a kind of a sublease to any interested parties who needed storage for, say, artifacts. 
So that was a way of actually generating a little bit of extra income as well. There is just a shot of CARM2, that's level two with the mesh flooring, which is nerve wracking when you look down, I don't mind telling you. And I'm moving on to CARM2, I'm just conscious about time. Um, this is the one of the um, shots of the, uh, that's the fire exit stairwell there we were looking at. And there's another elevation there. And they're built side by side, I should have said, but there was a slide with the plan there, so I maybe should have explained that a little clearly to you. So CARM2 repository was opened in 2010. And again, like CARM1, it is climate controlled and secure. This one, as I say, has a high density and medium density configuration. Um, it consists uh, currently of three floor, four floor blocks of uh, freestanding steel shelving. Um, with room for a fourth block to go in into an area that's empty at the moment, but which we call the void, um, giving us about 48 kilometres of shelving in total there. Um, we can do the high density configuration in this store, um, but we can also do the um, direct dump of uh, shelf mark order batches into the store. And this is what we're seeing here. This image here shows a collection from RMIT library of um, journals that are in call number order that have just been removed by a specialist removalist company and deposited directly onto the shelves. So no pre-processing whatsoever has gone on there. So it's much quicker and um, easier to do and the, it's cheaper to do. It's a quicker move and there's less handling. Um, and with, uh, I have a note there, the members and non-members own collections are housed in this uh, facility, but we also have some space for Caval for any growth for the shared collection, so it's got somewhere to move into, seeing as CARM1 is now full. Um, what has been popular with this model is the fact that the members were able to lease their space out whilst they, it was unused. So um, they were able to do deals amongst themselves if somebody temporarily needed, I don't know, two kilometres of space for eight months, they were able to work, come to an arrangement themselves. So they were able to save a little bit in, uh, um, a little bit of money in, in by that sort of a collaboration. It was funded by three of our of Caval's members and Caval. Um, they are Melbourne University, Monash University and RMIT University. Um, that is the configuration of the allocation of space that each of the institutions have in there. Um, and you can see the block at the end, void, that's where the fourth block could be built if, if need be. Oh my goodness me, I'm going to scoop up sketch on because I've got the light. Um, quickly reflecting on why was this built? Well, our members were sort of moving a little bit away from the shared collection idea and they wanted desperately somewhere to deposit their own collections where they didn't cede ownership of their, of their material. So um, when they looked at the various options, oops, when they considered the various options, the do nothing preservation outcome, as you can see, they're poor and risk very high. CARM2 upfront commitment, which is what we're talking about here, as you can see there, the preservation outcome was deemed excellent and the risk low, which is uh, really a motivating factor for the members to actually make a decision on moving forward with the CARM2. And here are the cost per volumes. Now, this is from obviously 2008 and 2009. Um, but you can see the very first one, capital contribution, which is what our members, our three members did, high density configuration. You can see that over a shorter period of time, it's relatively expensive to go down that route, but the longer you leave the item in, um, the more cost effective it does become. And that was, again, a motivating factor, I think. And there's just a shot of CARM2 when it was empty. And this is a shot actually of CARM2 from the void end. So we're looking straight at the three blocks in a row. Um, and I have another proper picture of that coming up. Here we go. And you see the little rope ladder there was installed um, for an acrobatic display for our grand opening. We wanted to demonstrate the scale of the space and that did so nicely. And that ladder is actually still in place because we can't take it down. It's too high. Okay. Okay, 
let's talk a little bit about what's good, what's not so great. It's all great. <laughs> okay. Okay, in general, um, we're using a model like Caval, you've got your reduced costs through economies of scale and the benefits of a membership of an organisation of that nature. Um, there's a shared pre-existing infrastructure there, purpose-built suite of offices, um, we're just staff waiting, waiting to help. Um, and a staff of library professionals, mainly um, library professionals are certainly li people who have worked in libraries before and who have that knowledge and understand the needs and requirements of libraries. And uh, the benefit of that is uh, we also have services that uh, non-members can avail of. Oops. Um, sorry, I just skipped there. Um, with regard to the space storage and shared collection, you've got your space creation and reclamation at your home institution. Um, going for the CARM2 option for our members meant there was less disruption for them it was and less expensive when compared to building their own uh, purpose-built facility. And of course, everything that goes into CARM2 can also be requested through interlibrary loans and document delivery services. And I know there's a red light, but I'm really close. Okay, I'll just, I'll just keep going. Okay, um, experience of the negatives. We're back to cost again because the high density configuration can be very expensive in the long term, in the short term, I beg your pardon, but um, it's cheaper in the long term. Um, academic staff, as we heard earlier this morning, can be reluctant to allow collections to go off site um, because they want to control and they want to be able to browse their own collections. Um, it can have negative implications for um, your account book and your university ranking, maybe. Um, and you need a lot of money to cough up, really, to, um, to see it through to fruition. And uh, negatives from a Caval point of view, well, they did have some business ideas that didn't quite work out due to lack of, um, a lack of a demand, really. So there was a digitising arm, a copyright permission service, and an MK Solutions um, partnership, which didn't quite pan out in the end. And I must say, CARM2 has now turned out to be the preferred model for Australia. Um, there tends to be, seems to be a little move away from the shared collection, um, with uh, universities looking more to protecting what they've got, and um, you know, rather than contributing to that shared idea. Um, possibilities for Ireland. Well, we've all received our copy of the Connell strategy for this year. And uh, it's action, deliver a major project to assess the options for a shared storage facility in Ireland. So I think that pretty much uh, sums that up. And um, from our own TCD library strategy document for 2015, um, and, uh, the, the, and this is a quote from it, advance an integrated space strategy that works toward all collections being housed in appropriate environmental conditions. And what this might look like, develop a national treasury of collaborative collection management and environmentally advanced storage with educational and national institutions and partners with an emphasis on the national benefits and shared access facilities. So I think uh, we're ready for it. Why not? Let's give it a go. <laughs> and I've just included a few references at the end there for you. And um, my blatant slide of manipulation, if it comes up, which, there we go. I had to put in some Aussie animals. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Michelle. That was really interesting and very pertinent to the Connell strategy as you